Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Hunter from EXL Events, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Understanding Risk-Based Monitoring Post-ICH E6R2 and the Impact on Sites. We are pleased to partner with the Evoca Group to bring you this webinar today. We want this webinar to be interactive, so I encourage you to ask questions and share your experiences. To ask questions and submit comments, please use the Q&A box, which you should see on the left of the slides on your screen. If you do not, go ahead and click the Q&A on the menu bar at the bottom of your screen, and this box should appear. Use this box to submit questions and comments at any time throughout this webinar, and we will pause periodically to review the questions and address them. But please note that we have over 800 people signed up for this webinar, so we will not be able to get to all the questions. So if your question isn't answered during today's webinar, we'll do our best to reach out to you following the webinar. You should also see on your screen to the right of the slides a box about our Clinical Quality Oversight Forum, which is taking place in just a few weeks on October 10th to 12th in Philadelphia. We are very excited to have the FDA presenting at this year's conference to discuss trends and expectations for inspections of clinical investigators and sponsors. We are offering a special discount for webinar participants, and you can click on this box to be redirected to the event website for more information. There's also a resources tab to the left of the slides that includes the event, this event link as well as the detailed agenda. There are additional resources available here as well, including an article that was featured in Applied Clinical Trials authored by one of our speakers, Chrissy McDonald, on the ICH guidelines. Now before I introduce the speakers, we do want to get a sense of who you are as an audience. Um, and what types of companies that you represent. So I want to ask a few interactive questions um, to get some of this demographic information. Um, so the first question is, what type of company do you represent? Are you a pharmaceutical biotechnology or device company, a CRO, a different clinical service provider, a site, or something else? If you could just click the box and then click the submit answer. Um, we'll go ahead and show those results. Okay, those results should come up here shortly. All right, it looks like most of you are from a pharmaceutical, biotechnology, or device company, 56%. About 30% represent CROs, only 2% are other clinical service providers, um, about 8% are sites, and then 4% other. Um, that is a really good mix for this discussion. That's great. All right, the next question, I just have one more before we get into the presentation, is going to be about the size of your company. What size do you consider your company? Would you consider your company a small company, a mid-sized company, or a large company? Uh, please go ahead and select your answer, and then click Submit. Okay, great. We'll give just a couple more seconds as people submit their answers. And, oh, it's a pretty good split. So we have about a little over 40% represent large companies. Then it's pretty evenly split, 30% small, 30% mid-sized. So that's, that's a great diverse audience. So that should make for some great discussion. All right, so now I'd like to officially introduce our two speakers. We have Dr. Chrissy McDonald, who is the Executive Director of Client Delivery at the Avoca Group and has 12 years of industry experience covering every stage of clinical trials from preclinical through late stage. We also have Jeff Kingsley, who is the CEO of IACT Health, which is a clinical research firm that covers over 25 therapeutic areas with more than 100 clinical investigators. Dr. Kinsley is also currently the Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Association of Clinical Research Professionals and is responsible for overseeing the completion of more than 100 clinical trials with over 1 million patients. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Chrissy and Jeff. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, first, I just want to do a quick overview of the VOCA group and who we are. 
So the Avoca Group is a life sciences consultant firm dedicated to improving quality and compliance in the clinical trial execution process. So we integrate deep subject matter expertise with industry-leading approaches and technology. We tailor solutions that help companies build industry-leading quality management, inspection readiness, and effective oversight systems into their existing processes. And our mission is to have a powerful impact on all clinical trials by helping clinical research companies increase their quality, ensure compliance, and improve efficiency so that medicines can reach patients faster. The Avoca Quality Consortium, which we will talk about today, was established in 2011 and has since developed over 400 leading practices for its members. Each member organization receives company-wide access to a comprehensive and proprietary knowledge center containing these 400 leading practices of guidelines, tools, templates, and processes, as well as AQC research and archived webinars like what we'll be talking about today. The consortium is a member-based, pre-competitive collaborative comprised of clinical operations, quality, and outsourcing professionals from pharma, biotech, CROs, and clinical service providers. So there's currently more than 90 member companies. If you see your company's name on this slide but don't know if you have access to the AQC Knowledge Center, please feel free to get in touch with us after today's webinar to request login credentials. If you don't see your company's name on this slide and want to learn a little bit more about becoming a member, please feel free to visit our website or contact us after the webinar. So we spoke today. The goal of today's webinar is to talk about ICHE6R2, the changes that were made with this guidance, and ultimately what that impact is going to be to the site. So how can sponsors proactively manage this change to optimize the quality that we're seeing across execution within clinical trials? My name, as Kristen said, is Chrissy McDonald. I'm the Executive Director of Client Delivery at the Avoca Group. So I oversee the work product that's released as part of the Avoca Quality Consortium and our consulting services group today. And with me, we have Dr. Jeff Kingsley. Uh, Jeff, will you introduce yourself and give a little bit of background about your uh, organization for the audience today? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm a family physician by training, but fell in love with research a couple of decades ago. And... Um, and I've done nothing but research for the last 13 or 14 years. Our company helps support physicians, and we fight that churn rate of physicians in research so that they can be successful and not be the one and dones. And so at this point, we have 15 offices across two states. We have about 200 concurrent research trials and well over 30 specialties. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. So as Kristen said today, we do want to cover quite a few things today. Uh, we'll cover the background of ICHE 6R2 and its impact on sites. The format and the goal for us today is really for this to be an interactive interview type format. So we'll be discussing the impact of these updates based on what myself and the Avoca Group sees with our sponsor and CRO type companies. And then ultimately to interview Jeff to see what's working and what's not working, and the downstream effects of R2 that he's seeing at the site level. So as Kristen said, there'll be pause points throughout the discussion today to address the audience questions. So we encourage you to participate throughout the next, I guess, 50 or 45 minutes or so. So first things first is we need to talk about the background of ICHE6R2 and what changes we've seen with the adoption of this revision too. So the next two slides that we're going to see actually outline the key updates to R2. The first one that we see here discusses how the guidance clearly refers to proactive quality management and the incorporation of quality by design processes in clinical trial execution. The guidance specifically addresses minimizing risk through planning and routine risk reviews while also looking for early signaling in order to mitigate the problems. So it discusses using pre-established quality tolerance limits for decision making and to investigate root causes of emergent problems as part of the corrective action process. So the expectation is that all of these steps are planned out and then documented in advance of the clinical trial beginning. 
which as most of us, I think we were at about uh, almost 54% uh, pharma and 31% CRO, can probably all admit that our experience in clinical trials is probably a little bit less proactive and more reactive. So the industry has sort of been in a constant state of putting out fires as opposed to, as opposed to be able, being able to proactively identify them, plan their mitigation, and then ultimately identify the point when that mitigation needs to be put in place prior to the risk occurring. The next section of the key updates outlines the expectation on use of risk-based strategies. So this is not only risk-based monitoring, which is the focus of today's discussion, so we're accustomed to hearing that as when we're talking about risk-based strategies, but also risk-based strategies to infection preparedness, risk-based risk -based strategies to quality management. So the goal is to provide oversight and processes commensurate with the risks that matter. So the key item of note here is that the expectation is that these strategies, the corresponding roles and responsibilities that are a part of identifying these risks, and ultimately the oversight reports in identifying these risks have to be documented, as well as any updates to those strategies to prove that the system's not static, but again, responsive and dynamic and able to adjust based on the current risk pro profile of the clinical trial. So again, another key point here of moving the industry from this reactive to proactive state of risk management. And the last section on this slide points out that the sponsor and investigator still retain the accountability for quality. Therefore, oversight of outsourced resources must be appropriately overseen to ensure that the quality is there, because at the end of the day, the sponsor and the investigator are still going to be held accountable for the quality and the output. The next three items that we have here address electronic systems, serious breaches, and essential records. ICHE6R2 was implemented, or not R2, excuse me, um, ICHE6 version 1 was implemented nearly 20 years ago. So at the time, and the reason that R2 came out is because there was a need to address the changing technologies in our world, the EDC, the CTMS. I'm sure most of us who have been in the industry for 10 plus years um, recall the adoption and development of EDC. So I'm sure many of us on the phone have lived through paper-based CRFs. So as a result of the, the move to these electronic data collection systems, uh, these aggregate reporting tools that we have, R2 points out that validation as well as appropriate training of users is necessary for these systems. And in turn, you also have to have SOPs governing the system setup, the installation, and use of these systems to ensure that the quality and data integrity remains. The guidelines implicitly advises moving away from these paper-based CRFs and tracking systems because of the delays that it causes in real-time risk mitigation. In terms of serious breaches, the expectation is that regulators are informed where warranted by the local authorities when instances of noncompliance meet the requirements of either a serious breach of protocol or GCP. Again, the intent that it's a more proactive way of monitoring issues within the clinical trial. And lastly, in terms of essential records, R2 has added the additional C to the traditional ALCOA. Therefore, the expectation is that documentation is attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate, and now complete. So in addition, some process documents are now being considered essential documents. An example of that is that the risk review would require traceability and decision making being documented. The same would go for monitoring activities and quality management. So lastly, there's now an expectation that the end of the trial report has a selection or a section that's dedicated to the quality tolerance limits and whether the risk management of the trial was effective. So I'm sure now that we've gone through that background, a lot of you are thinking now, I thought we were here to talk about investigator and site impact. And none of those updates that we just discussed really directly impact the site, with the exception of the fact that the guidance still states that the investigator and the sponsor are responsible for quality. So what gives? And the truth is that while the industry-wide question for the last few years is how are sponsors and CROs going to address this regulatory change, for the most part, 
it's been business as usual for the sites with a few key exceptions. So the three main ways that the sites are affected by R2, although often as a downstream impact, is the promotion of the use of that risk-based monitoring, the use of quality tolerance limits, and as we stated before, the sponsor investigator retaining the responsibility for quality. So before we get into risk-based monitoring, I'd first like to address the quality tolerance limits and the idea of that sponsor investigator retaining the responsibility for quality piece. So in my experience, based on what we've seen so far in terms of quality tolerance limits being established within organizations, there's often three to five parameters that are selected that would impact the interpretability of the clinical trial. So the quality tolerance limits are often related to the number of patients lost to long-term follow-up, the number of patients enrolled that were ineligible per the entry criteria, et cetera. And the other thing that we've noted is that these parameters are often documented within a risk management plan or another document that's not widely distributed to the sites. So my question for all of us today, as well as for Jeff on the phone, is if we're asking investigators to be held accountable in conjunction with the sponsors, wouldn't it be a key piece of information as well as updates to the metrics that's being tracked that we'd want to share with our investigators? So in April of this year, the Avoca Group partnered with ACRP for the first ever quality, con or quality Congress. And a key piece of information that we heard was that while investigators are being held accountable for quality, we're not giving them the measures that they need to be able to determine what is, in fact, good quality. So with that being said, um, I'd like to take a minute to get some input from Dr. Kingsley to address what he's seen so far with the implementation of the quality tolerance limits, which has a downstream effect on investigators, and also to determine whether he feels the sites are getting the information needed to be able to meet these quality tolerance limits or ultimately be able to proactively raise a flag if any of them become a risk at the site that the investigators are seeing. So Jeff, do you have anything to add there? Whew. Okay. <laughs> So you're, you're spot on. Um, it is business as usual at the site. We are not seeing changes. Quality tolerance limits are not being shared with us. Um, you know, fundamentally, quality has always been the site's responsibility. Once a site makes a mistake, there's nothing that you can do about it. You can try and add an explanation. You can add a kappa you can shine that blemished apple up, but you can't undo what was done. Sites have always had responsibility for, uh, for creating high quality at the first touch. And yes, uh, we don't seem to have a collaborative environment with sponsors and CROs. This, this QTL data is being collected but not shared. And if, in fact, it's ever shared, it's shared as a lagging indicator. It's shared long after the trial is done. It's shared after um, uh, the, the majority of the protocol has happened. One of the reasons is that many times the quality assessments are done in comparison to all of the sites that are on a study. And so it becomes really quite a, a lagging indicator. Um, so that's, that's what I'm seeing. That's helpful. So ultimately, that's what you're seeing. And what would the better way be? How could you see partnering with sponsors and CROs to really meet these quality tolerance limits that are now kind of required? So given the experience that most of these are, um, you know, defined in advance of the trial, and in places where you wouldn't see. And I know we're going to talk about risk-based monitoring, and, and one of the things that we do know is that often risk-based monitoring plans are not shared with sites, and so at a risk of right. jumping ahead too far in advance, would, would putting quality tolerance limits and what we're tracking, the metrics that we're tracking, and, and what flags we expect to see raised as part of uh, a site-shared document, which you know may or may not be, as we know, uh, a monitoring plan? Is, is that a way to help assist? Absolutely. So you're right. The, these plans are almost never shared. In, in, almost never. might even be too generous. 
are never shared with the, with the sites. Um, so as we're as we're evolving and how we're doing this and getting into risk-based monitoring, sites have to start budgeting for a different type of activity. The monitoring plan needs to be shared with the site well in advance of contract and budget negotiation, certainly in advance of the trial starting. And the tolerance limits should be shared as well. Sites are busy, especially sites that are also running clinical practices. That adds uh, an added level of complexity. You mentioned a QTL of patients lost to follow-up. That's a classic example. In my experience, patients seldom ever withdraw consent. They seldom ever make a conscious choice to withdraw consent and quit a trial. What happens more often is they get bored or something else happened in their life and they became busier and their life got away from them, just like all of our lives get away from us. And if you, if you go the extra mile and you really reach out to that patient, many times you end up retaining that patient and the patient is not lost to follow up. You end up with a few protocol deviations for some maybe missed visits or out of windows, but you didn't end up with a lost to follow up patient. But if sites don't understand that tolerance limit or where the entire study is against that tolerance limit or where their own site is against that tolerance limit, then they are less apt to go the extra mile to ensure that, that they are uh, super compliant with that item. That's helpful. Thanks, Jeff. So one question that I see that came up that I'd like to address real quick is someone asked what quality tolerance limits, what, what does a quality tolerance mean, limit mean, and do we have an example? So ICH-E6R2 specifically called out the request that sponsors, when designing their study, should have key parameters, they call them quality tolerance limits, that they should be following that will give a preliminary indication of whether or not the study is at risk. Um, and the definition of at risk is really not whether the drug is working. It is whether or not you are potentially not going to be able to evaluate the data that you get. So uh, the, the FDA guidance is less concerned about whether the drug works or not and more concerned about are we putting patients at risk to get the correct scientific information. And so a quality tolerance limit is a metric that you're tracking that identifies when you might be at risk to having a study that's inevaluable. So if your primary endpoint is that you need to have so many patients complete it, the study and complete the follow-up, then a quality tolerance limit that you might track would be the number of patients that you can afford to lose statistically and still have the trial be valuable. So that is an example of a quality tolerance limit that you would choose. Um, they're typically related to evaluability of the trial as well um, and based on the endpoints that are assigned for the trial. That's one question. There are a couple other questions, there's one more here where it says QTLs are metrics that are across all study sites, and they ask if it's useful to share QTLs with the sites. They identify that it would seem that K, K, KRIs, or key risk indicators, would be more appropriate to share with sites. And I think the idea is that a, a KRI can be a QTL. And so to Jeff's point, and Jeff chime in, at, any point if, you, if you'd mm -hmm. like to. But I think the idea is that if you are counting on your sites to ensure that, I'm, I'm making these numbers up, 99 of 150 of the patients complete the long-term follow-up, for you to be able to adequately evaluate that study, you would want to let your sites know if you are close to enrolling 150 patients and right now you only have 96 patients of the 99 that you need to have an evaluable study because you want your investigators to know that they need to do whatever it is they can to not lose a patient to long-term follow-up. Right? Yep. Does that yeah, resonate I, 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 with you? I completely agree. We're on the same team. And 
if we get better at transparency and we get better at sharing this information, sites will rally to the cause. They're not doing the trial uh, because they're disengaged or, or not impassioned by, by this mission. If, if we engage with sites more, they will, they will push even harder and they will be rowing in the same direction that you're rowing. That sounds great. So with that, I think we can move on a little bit um, to the bulk of what we're trying to talk about today. So with that, I'd like to move into the promotion of risk-based monitoring per ICHE6R2 and discuss the effects this implementation is having across the industry uh, and mainly with sponsor and CROs interactions with sites. So Transcelerate has an initiative on risk-based monitoring, and they found the following bits of information about traditional monitoring techniques. And so they found that clinical trials have varying levels, or clinical trial sites, excuse me, have varying levels of experience and quality. But current monitoring approaches aren't set or designed to address those differences. So an example would be that 100% SDV um, might have an organization spending too much time monitoring a very experienced high quality site, while risk-based monitoring, if it's um, very light, might not allow enough time or effort with a new investigative site. So they provided research that indicated when 100% source data verification was performed, it actually was not effective at identifying material risk, and that there's often a very low amount of transcription error that would in turn impact the data availability. Yet still, the monitoring approaches were unchanged. So they noted that targeted site monitoring in SDV could lead to improved data quality and patient safety for clinical trials by reducing efforts on low value activities. So before we start addressing what all of you on the line do in terms of risk-based monitoring and talk about risk-based monitoring types, Jeff, you live through these types of monitoring, and when we were speaking the other day, you were discussing how effective your site is at producing high-quality data. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the risk-based monitoring part later, but can you speak a little bit about the pros and cons that you've seen in terms of the 100% source data verification? 100% source data verification is largely a waste of everyone's time, which is, is what you talked about in, in the middle bright green row there. It, it, there's a, a large amount of what's done that provides very little value, and it's, in my opinion, a waste of an incredibly valuable resource, the CRC and the CRA, um, spending time on something that's not where they should be uh, something that's immaterial, something that, that they should not be wasting their time doing. Interestingly, as we move into central monitoring and risk-based monitoring, new approaches, monitors, CRAs, are having a hard time thinking differently. The evolution hasn't really happened yet. You know, I have a, a healthcare system that I do research for, and they used to have a local IRB. And they disbanded the local IRB um, at FDA guidance and remade their process to go with a central IRB. But we created what was called a research integrity panel. So they still knew what was going on on their campus. But the research integrity panel was staffed with the previous IRB members. It's been years, and they struggle with not thinking they are the IRB. They're still unable to take that hat off, even though they're no longer the IRB of record, and change the roles and responsibilities they should be doing. We're hitting the same barrier with, with CRAs today. That's great. All right, I think at this point in time, before we start talking about each of the risk-based monitoring types, I think it's clear that risk-based monitoring is the way that we have to go based on all of the input that uh, Dr. Kingsley just shared. But what I want to do first is open it up to the audience 
And for those of you on the line, what percentage of your organization studies currently utilize some form of risk-based monitoring? So if you go ahead and fill in, there's less than 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, or greater than 75%. And if you're not using any type or you're doing a lot of risk-based monitoring, maybe put a comment in the Q&A on kind of where you were and the rationale behind perhaps why you're not. So we could talk about that in a little bit. Do three more seconds here. One, two, three, and let's... Close the poll. It takes a couple minutes for it to show up on your end, so bear with us here. But what I'm seeing is a pretty decent distribution here. So we have about 40% of us are doing less than 25%. For, so for that 40%, I'd love to hear where you're at in terms of what indication you're studying, what phase, why, you know, that's so low for you. Um, then we're at about 23% at the 25 to 50%, 20% at the 50 to 75, and about 16% at greater than 75. So that's a really interesting distribution there. And one more here. So as we talk about the types of risk-based monitoring, I see that we have definitely some experiences. Um, if that 40% that marked less than 25% aren't 0%. Um, but before we get into type of risk-based monitoring, I'd like to do a brief overview of each of the types. Another finding that we had at the ACRP Avoca Quality Congress back in April was that there's actually varied use of terminology when it comes to risk-based monitoring types. So just to make sure we're on the same page for our discussion today, I want to talk about the types of risk-based monitoring to make sure that the next question is the data we get back is accurate. But so the three types that we're going to talk about specifically today is centralized monitoring. So that's when you're doing some risk-based approaches in that you are only doing centralized monitoring and using data analytics to review and perform real-time analysis and reporting through e-sources. So in this model, there's metrics and tolerance limits for what's an acceptable deviation range. The second type would be remote or off-site site management monitoring, which covers the site relationship and management, so talking about recruitment, ISF, et cetera, um, and following up on any anomalies or deviations that are identified during the centralized monitoring. And then lastly, there's actual on-site site management monitoring, where there's a risk-based assessment of overall quality and performance and identifying these gaps and issues. So if we look at those three types and we open up another polling question for those of you that are using risk-based approaches, so what type of risk-based monitoring does your organization use? And you're going to give a, given those three options, along with some other and none of the above. So feel free to go ahead and check all that applies there. And remember, the question is, what types of risk-based monitoring? And so if your yes. organization is doing non-risk-based on-site management, then you would not click that button, only if it's on-site but truly risk-based. Yes, great clarification. Thank you. Couple more seconds to put in those answers there. And let's go to those polling results. Should be coming up shortly for you all. I'll talk through them as we're there. So the highest is actually on site site management. So again, with the expectation that it is risk-based, and we actually seem to have a tie, yep, so there's a tie actually with centralized monitoring and remote 
off-site management, which makes sense since they are tied a little bit together. There's 3.9% other and 9.4% none of the above. So if you were an other, if you want to write in that Q&A other as well as what type you're actually utilizing, that would be beneficial. And for none of the above, if it's because we don't have it listed, I would love for you to put in that Q&A none of the above and what type you're using. If you're none of the above because you're not doing any risk-based, that's fine too. You can just leave that blank. But so what I want to do next is actually talk about those key types of monitoring. And I want to take the time to get Dr. Kingsley's thoughts on some of these concepts. So I have a few key questions to ask him about each of those. And I think I'd like to start with the ones that were the most re or utilized. So risk-based on-site site management monitoring seemed to be the highest rated there in terms of use. So Jeff, do you or have you seen changes since ICHE6R2 came into the picture with this type of monitoring, so on-site site management monitoring at your organization? Are you seeing uh, increased use of it? Are you seeing different types of use of it? What, what are you seeing since ICHE6R2 came into the picture in terms of on-site site management risk-based monitoring? Okay, so perhaps a two-part answer. So I'm seeing a reduction in on-site site management monitoring. So that is a change that I'm seeing. There is, there is more remote and centralized monitoring than there was in the past. However, when there is on-site site management monitoring, it is not risk-based. When there is on-site uh, monitoring, the CRAs continue to go page after page after page and look at everything and put post-it notes on pieces of paper or annotate uh, electronic source. Um, it is not a risk-based approach when CRAs are on site. Excellent. And how about, what do you see working well with this? Have you seen examples of this risk-based approach where it's working? So that's challenging to answer because sponsors and CROs aren't sharing their risk plans with sites. And so there's a possibility that, that sponsors and CROs are doing quite a bit of high quality risk-based work that they're not sharing with us. And I'm seeing monitors less because our quality is good and I'm not aware of that. There's also the possibility that, uh, that they have bad data of one type or another, and it's not being shared with us. And then there's on-site management that's then refuting or reinforcing what they thought they saw centrally. Um, so I don't want to be overly judgmental and make the assumption that there's not a lot of good risk-based monitoring happening. I think there is, but it's not being shared. We're not being invited to be part of the quality management team with sponsors and CROs. I think that that's probably absolutely the case. And so one of the other yeah. questions that I wanted to ask you about all of these, and I think you addressed it as far as suggestions on what the industry can do better. And I think in terms of what you said was dysfunctional and that really most of what you're seeing in on-site site management is not risk-based. You know, what we can do better as an industry is obviously to, to move it to a more risk-based approach. But any other words of wisdom on, on how we as an industry and sponsors and CROs can work together better with sites to, to do this better um, other than you know, really sharing the information? Well, sure, there are lots of things that we can do to get better. Um, part of it is just simply going to take time. 
monitors that grew up in the age of 100% source data verification. It's going to take years to get out of that paradigm and to get comfortable with no longer looking at every shred of data, but rather focusing where where an algorithm tells you that you should focus and focus where your tolerance limits tell you that you need to focus. That will take time. Two, we have to become transparent and sites have to become part of the quality management team with sponsors and CROs and that starts before the trial starts. That starts before the before the contract and budget and then and then continues all the way through. We should literally be able to see the same quality data on our site that you are seeing as a sponsor or CRO on your end. That transparency is what we need to be able to elevate the bar on, on the quality that's coming out of sites. Um, I think that's really and helpful. Then we get into, oh, then ahead. we get into the, the, the financial aspects, which um, you know, you've, you've heard me speak about before. Um, you know, true, robust QA, QC programs are expensive. Um, there are 400 and some odd people that are listening to this and are, are dedicated QA people. You all know that your quality departments are not cheap. Quality assurance people are not cheap. Running high quality programs is an expensive endeavor, but we do it because we're experimenting on human beings. This is not some, you know, we're not running car washes. We're experimenting with people. The level of quality should be immaculate, and that's expensive. But the paradigm today is that the R&D spend on quality is going to sponsors and CROs to clean up errors and mistakes that sites made. And my belief is that we need to change the paradigm and start empowering sites to improve quality on their own. Sites would need to be reimbursed for that work. And then frankly, sites that don't have the ability to produce high quality would go out of business, which is acceptable. This is high risk work that we're doing. And, and sites should be the tip of that spear in producing high quality out of the gate. Absolutely. I think that's huge. So we're getting a lot of questions in, and I want to be able to ask them. A lot of them are directed towards you and sites in general. So I'd like to get to those, but before we do that really quickly, there were the two other types, and they are tied together a little bit. The first being risk-based centralized monitoring, the second being risk-based um, off-site site management or remote monitoring. So in your opinion, again, are you see you said you're seeing an, an increase in those um, mm -hmm. it, along the same lines you know what's working what's not working and what can the industry do better with those types is it still just a transparency factor um, yep. is it an understanding one of the things that we also talked about at the quality congress which really resonated and is stuck in in my head is that um, oftentimes the expectations of quality, aside from not sharing them, the feedback that we were hearing is that oftentimes they're shared and the definition of good is so variant across different CROs and sponsors that it's another thing that makes it really difficult for you as the site to address, you know, what is good. Um, does any of that tie in to, you know, what's working and what's not working with these centralized or remote monitoring? pieces? Yeah, completely. And unfortunately, it really does come back to the, the transparency issue. So yes, there is a substantial uptick in centralized monitoring and remote monitoring. And that's wonderful because several years ago, we went through a period where remote monitoring meant we were, we were scanning things back and forth to each other, which was incredibly inefficient. And it was still 100% source data verification just with us being in different cities. Um, we are seeing an improvement in that, and we are seeing substantial amounts of centralized and remote monitoring. What we can't tell because there's no transparency is whether or not the remote monitoring is actually risk-based, or is it remote and really 100% SDV, just simply remote. 
that dialogue isn't happening. What I perceive is that central monitoring is risk-based and that most remote monitoring is still not risk-based. Um, there, there may be a dialogue going on saying, hey, you need to focus on X, Y, and Z based upon an algorithm, a big data look at the data set coming out of my site. But what is happening in remote monitoring is still uh, an evaluation of every piece of data, not simply what risk-based should be. Chrissy, you might be on mute. I am, yes. Thank you. <laughs> sorry I said it. Yep. This is excellent. And I'm sorry if I'm a little distracted here, but I'm actually looking at quite a few of these questions that are coming in, and they're actually really fantastic. So yeah. what I'd like to do is take some time to move to some of these questions. So, Jeff, I know that you can see them. So if there's any that yep. you want to cherry pick out of there, please feel free to do so. But I have picked a couple that I think we can start off with and get your thoughts. Um, in terms of risk-based review, and this is less so about what CROs and sponsors are doing, but we did get someone who asked about your thoughts on PI review of ECRF data in terms of do you do a risk-based review, and if so, what do you review, what don't you review typically, and why? <laughs> oh, this is a hot potato. So, so when I'm signing off on, on EDC, do I actually take a look at every shred of data in the EDC? No. You actually can't do that. It wouldn't be possible. Um, do I, however, take a risk-based approach to my evaluation of the data? Yes, absolutely I do. But it's expensive. It's an investment that we make as a company on our own. So we have a quality assurance and compliance committee staffed with um, eight to ten individuals at any given point in time. They've all had significant quality training. They review all of our data in real time and report on it weekly. And so every week I can see if anywhere in the company there was a significant error that happened. So for example, a patient randomized in violation of inclusion exclusion would be a massive issue. And I would see that in real time. If there were, uh, if there was a big uptick in patients lost to follow up, we would see that and we track those, those metrics. So the question was kind of around EDC. My answer isn't really that I review that in EDC, but rather I review it in our source documents in real time. Excellent. Thanks. And so another question ties back to everything that we've talked about about sharing monitoring plans. So someone asked um, if other companies have shared monitoring plans with the site before. So they noted that it's not something they've ever done and they actually chose not to share these with the sites. So I know you can't necessarily speak for all of the companies that are represented today, Jeff, but in the totality of all the trials that you're conducting, can you give us a X out of X share the monitoring plans estimate of numbers? Yeah, 0.00%. Um, <laughs> It's not really that bad, but it's almost almost never. And when we ask for the monitoring plan during study startup, we're almost always told that it's not complete and can't be shared. Um, I was just speaking at a conference last week, and part of what we were talking about is the, is the need for transparency. Um, we need to start trusting each other more. If I trust you, then... I'm not going to be afraid to share a half-baked document with you to show you my work in progress. Yes, the monitoring plan might not be completely vetted and approved by all of the different people that need to put their signature of approval on us, 
but why not share it while it's a work in progress and just state it as a work in progress? And we can see that document as it evolves. That's the level of transparency I would love to see us get to in our industry. And so the, the next question is a tie up and also because it's going to um, set me up with a lob pitch to say what I want to say, but <laughs> it, it is, it is, how have the sites adapted to a risk-based monitoring mindset? And it says, in our experiences, sites oftentimes confuse RBM with remote monitoring. And yes. the reason I, I say that is, yes, that's probably true. And how can you address that? I would say by sharing your monitoring plan so that they understand what you mean when you're saying such and such type of monitoring. So, well, Jeff, I think what we heard back in, oh, go ahead. Nope, don't want to cut you off. I, I would say it's bigger than that. I would say it's bigger than that. You know, I was picking on CRAs a short while ago and saying that they're having a hard time dropping their old paradigm of 100% source data verification. Well, the same is true of sites. The, the world is moving toward risk-based monitoring, which is brilliant and so necessary in our industry. But yes, I want that transparency, and yes, this material needs to be shared with sites, but let's be real. Most sites, if you share this material with them, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're not going to have the resources to do anything with it. They don't have the staff. They don't have a quality assurance group doing that internally in their company. They're not set up yet to do their own risk-based work. Um, that's going to require us um, – speaking at conferences and continuing to sing this song and making sure that sites begin to mature. I saw a question about how do we make sites compliant? Well, fire them. This is mandatory. This is not a nice to have. This is a must to have. Sites that can't produce high quality work need to stop doing research. We need to elevate the bar on what we demand of site performance Sites need to be paid differently in their contracts and budgets to be able to support significant quality-based staff, which right now sites don't get paid for. One of the things that I talk about when I speak at finance conferences, research finance conferences, is that quite literally our budgets today, sites are paid to give you data. If we make mistakes, we get paid exactly the same. If we have incredible quality data, we get paid exactly the same as the sites that have average quality data, the same as the sites that have poor quality data. That paradigm needs to go away. That's, that's silly. But if we want sites to elevate their performance, we need to change how we're doing contracting and budgeting and site selection. And I'm all for it. Yep. So just to go, that was a perfect segue to our next slide, but just to go back really quickly, um, and talk about, you know, people are saying they're not sharing. So what I've heard in terms of why they don't want to share their monitoring plans is because they don't want the sites to only clean up the data that they're going to look at. And I think the idea is that in terms of the resourcing and the business aspect is for you as a site to align with the sponsors and CROs is you want to use your resources to look at the data that they're not going to look at to ensure that that is high quality. Um, and not spend as much of your resource, resources on what they're going to look at. So it's an interesting sort of look in the mirror perspective of, you know, a counter argument to why you wouldn't share your monitoring plan versus why you actually should. So I thought that that was just an interesting thing to note there. Um, just moving on to the last slide, I see we only have about six minutes left. So one of the things that you just segued very nicely into, Jeff, was, you know, what that impact is on sites. And I think a lot of it has to do with what you said. It's, it's this risk-based process um, or implementation is changing how the sites have to operate. And so this slide here, I'll turn it over to you to talk about that business impact analysis and what it means for these sites and how they're operating. You know, you, we've, we've discussed before, um, in fact, when we were doing the Avoca Congress earlier this year, there are sites with R2, there are sites that are starting to say, hey, wait a minute, you're increasing my workload. 
I have to now all of a sudden start paying attention to quality on my own. And the interesting thing is, it's always been that way. Sites were always supposed to be responsible for doing their own QA work, but it, it has evolved over the course of decades where there's a massive R&D spend that goes to CROs or, to, or, or that the sponsors are maintaining their own teams, and sites create data and then wait for someone else to come in and review all of that data uh, back in the paradigm of 100% source data verification and find the errors, find the elevated blood pressure that you didn't acknowledge as an adverse event, find documentation of a change in medication that you didn't update on your ConMed log. Um, it actually was always the site's responsibility, but R2 is is becoming the stimulus for this conversation with sites saying it was always your responsibility. Now, as I, as I said earlier, it is expensive. And right now, literally, sites are disincentivized to invest in quality because we're not paid for it. We're paid to give data. So any investment a site makes on quality is reducing its profit margin. It's reducing its ability to keep the lights on. And, and that needs to go away. Risk-based monitoring impact on sites means sites should have increased staff resources. You can't have a coordinator who's hired and expert at crossing T's and dotting I's, but wants to spend his or her time in front of patients collecting data. Asking that coordinator to also be a quality person, think about this from an HR perspective. You go to your HR department and you say, I want you to hire this person, and you're describing somebody who can be a great coordinator and a great quality manager. Increasingly, if you're asking for multiple hats, you're looking for a unicorn. It's hard to find people that can be good in both of those worlds. And so there are really different roles, but that requires changing the org chart at a site and adding to headcount. Processes, procedures, training, that needs to happen at the site level. And it really doesn't need to be the role or responsibility of the CRO or sponsor to teach sites how to do that. Sites should take on that responsibility themselves, but that's an, that's an investment. And it's only the most business-oriented sites, the, the larger sites, the sites that are doing this as, as a mission and as a, a, a full-time uh, a full-time gig that are going to be able to do all of that. Obviously, you've got many more, um, many more bullets going around the circle there that, that everyone can see. Um, all of these things need to change. The impact on the sites is massive, not because R2 actually changed the site's responsibility, but because it's shining a light on the fact that sites have to do this, and in fact, sites just lost their safety net. It was always the site's responsibility, but sites just lost their safety net. I think that's a perfect synopsis. So we have about two minutes remaining. I want to just quickly run through a summary of what we've learned today. I want to reiterate that there were a ton of great questions, and we're going to do our best to get answers out to everybody on those. Um, but what we learned today is that I think based on ICAT 6 R2, Risk-based approaches are here to stay for all phase one through three clinical trials. So ultimately, we as an industry need to make sure that we're working as effectively and efficiently as possible together to ensure high-quality clinical trials. Um, what we also discussed is that when developed and ex executed effectively by sponsors uh, and sites learn early in the study of any issues, they can correct them resulting in less rework and non-invaluable subjects. But what I think we actually learned is that we're still figuring out what executing effectively looks like because it seems like for the Agreed. most part, we are, we're still working on that. Um, and lastly, we very nicely touched, thanks to Dr. Kingsley, the impact on site resourcing processes, procedures, and budgets. So we're learning a little bit on how our decisions and what we do impact how a site works and how ultimately if we can lay out to them our expectations a little bit better, then perhaps we can help them build those processes in a way that makes sense for everybody involved. 
So time is actually up. I'm going to skip the questions. Here are some upcoming webinars and conferences that we have if you're interested in learning more about quality and compliance in clinical trials. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. A special thank you to Dr. Kingsley for taking the time to help educate us on how our decisions impact those that are the most important to getting the patients and the data for our trials, which is you, our investigators, and our sites. Um, and I think that that is all we have. So thanks again for joining us, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Wonderful. And thank I just you, want everyone. to Thank you so much. I just want to accentuate that later this week you will receive an email with the recorded version of this webinar and the slide deck. Um, and for those people, like Chrissy said, that didn't get their question answer, questions answered, we are definitely going to be following up with you to try and get everything answered. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chrissy and Jeff, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.